Hey, what's up everyone? My name is Praetorian and welcome to my Hearts of Iron 4 Beginner's Guide. Now, in this second video, we're going to be covering the combat side of things. We're going to be covering land, air, and naval combat. Uh, but remember that this is a guide meant for beginners. This is going to be showing you all the things you need to know in order to be able to engage in combat in this game. Uh, just everything that you need to know as a beginner, but it's not going to be showing you advanced uh, combat techniques and such. That would, that would be for another video. This is very much meant for beginners who are new to the game. Now, the first thing I wanted to show you guys before we really actually get into the combat is something related to combat, and that's training and experience. Now, I think this is very important because and it's something that uh, a lot of new players may not know about, so I would like to cover it in this video here. Now, every unit has an experience level. Uh, level 1, if you recall when we went into recruit and deployment, uh, when we first recruit a unit, they have to get their uh, all their equipment supplied, and they also have to to get trained up to level two. Now, if you were to uh, basically deploy this unit before they had their full training, then they would be level one out here on the map. But if you let them finish their training, then they'll start out as level two, and you'll see they'll have these two little chevrons. Now, what we want to do is get these level two guys up to level three like these guys here. Now you'll see that level 3 regular units give a 25% modifier in combat. Now that's pretty significant, so it's definitely something that you're going to want to do if you have the time, if it's, if it's something that you're able to do. Now the first thing we're going to have to do to get these units training is we're going to need to put them in a group. Now once we have them in a group, you'll see that we have a little button here that we can say exercise. And all you need to do is press that button and you'll see that they are now exercising. Now I like to put a leader here. This is definitely something that you don't need. I just like having the units all, uh, leaders all down here. Um, and I would usually put a level one guy in here that you're not using for anything else here. Uh, we're just gonna go ahead and select that guy there. Now that was pretty basic, really easy. But what I wanna teach you guys how to do is to basically create a, a, a full-time training unit that all of your units are going to go to as soon as they're done getting all their equipment and their basic training so that they can get trained up to regular. Now, first thing we're gonna to wanna to do is we're gonna to want to select a garrison area. Now we're gonna to want to garrison them in this state here. And the reason why we wanna do this is because if we have them garrisoned, then the, the unit commander is gonna basically spread them out across this state here. Now this is important so you don't have all of your units sitting in the same pro uh, province here, um, which they may end up getting attrition, and they'll also be able to provide defense and suppression in these areas. So it's a good thing to select a garrison area for your training units. Now we're going to want to go into our recruit and deployment uh, tab here. And you'll see I've already set up uh, several units for that are uh, currently training. Now what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to put them all in a location which is going to be the same location that we have these guys uh, training in right now. All right, and then next we're going to want to assign them to this uh, group here. And the way we do that is we just uh, select this little uh, circle here and then we left click on the unit we want to go to. And now you see that they have this unit color now and we're going to want to do that with all of them. And now, as soon as these guys have their equipment and they're trained up to level two, they're going to join this unit and they're gonna go ahead and start training uh, all the way up to level three. And they'll also garrison this entire uh, state for us. So this is a useful little way that you can get all your units starting training up to level three as soon as they are ready. So now that we know how to train our units, we're gonna go ahead and start looking at land combat. Now we're on the 1939 opening scenario here, and war has not started yet. Now before we start this conflict with Poland, we're gonna to wanna to go ahead and get our units set up. Now the way I'm about to set this up guys is in no way the optimal way to do it, uh, but I'm attempting to show you guys how this works. So we're gonna go ahead and select a few units here. We're gonna give him all of these guys I guess and go ahead and select a new group and we're gonna give them a commander let's give them somebody good why not Erwin Rommel the desert fox that's one of my favorite generals he is awesome and then we're gonna go ahead and select uh, create another group right here and while we're doing that we're gonna take a look at leaders because it's something that has not been covered in these videos yet now we have two different kinds of leaders guys we have generals and then we have field marshals which I'm not seeing well, you might not, oh, there we go, field marshal right there. Now, the major difference between generals and field marshals is how many units they can control. Now, you see generals, they can only control up to 24 divisions, while field marshals can control an unlimited amount. 
Now you may be wondering why even use uh, generals then if field marshals can control so many units without any penalties. Well, the, the, there's a major difference between generals and field marshals, and that is the traits that they gain. Now generals basically gain traits that uh, are very specialized traits. Uh, for instance, uh, let's look at here. We have... A Panzer Leader, that's one that you're only going to be seeing uh, for a general. Uh, they'll also see ones that are for specific types of terrain, like hill fighter or mountain fighter. Well, while uh, field marshals, on the other hand, are going to gain very different traits here. Uh, ones that affect large groups, pe people like offensive doctrine, which you know increases the, the combat width. Or you also see ones that affect supply. I see those with the field marshals quite a bit. So yeah, they do have very different traits, so depending on what you wanted to use them for is uh, going to uh, basically determine whether you want to use a field marshal or a general. Now you can always promote your generals up to field marshal just using this button here. Now what's going to happen if you promote them? Well first of all, you're going to lose one of your skill levels. Each one of these skill levels increases attack and defense by 5%. So you see here, uh, this Manstein guy uh, has level four, so he's got a 20% uh, bonus to attack and defense. And they, they will increase their skill as they uh, lead units in combat. Now another thing that's going to happen when you promote them is they're going to lose all of their positive traits, uh, which is, is uh, pretty negative, so <laughs> definitely not something that you're going to want to do with some of your best commanders here. Now, so we're going to go ahead and select that guy. That'll work. And then we're going to select, we're going to create one more group over here. And once again, like I said, this is not the optimal way of doing things. Now that we have our army set up, we can go ahead and start setting up battle plans. Now, first of all, what are battle plans? Well, you can always control your units manually. You know, select a unit or group of units and select right click and they're going to move wherever you tell them to. Or, you know, you could, if this, if we were actually at war with them, we could right click there and they're going to start fighting these guys and move to this province. Now, manually controlling all your units can be a very micromanagement intensive. Uh, so it's something that you may not always want to do. You usually actually probably are not going to want to do it. Now, I was actually required to use battle plans quite a bit, testing them out. And from my experience... I have found that manually controlling your units is far superior. It's just more efficient. However, when you're playing the AI in single player, well, the AI is whether it's controlling your units or it's controlling its own units, it's the same level of, of efficiency. So the battle plans actually work just fine against the AI. I haven't had any problems. It actually works quite well, and I don't have to worry about micromanagement. Now, sometimes I will still manually use my units, but it's great using these battle plans. However, and I just wanted to note this, if you are in multiplayer and you're using battle plans and they're using manual uh, control, uh, you will notice that you, your units may have, be having some issues because the battle plans is, is just not perfect and it, it doesn't work uh, as well in multiplayer. But we're in single player so we don't have to worry about that so we're going to go ahead and start learning about the battle plans. Now first we're going to go ahead and select our purple unit here, Army 2 under Erwin Rommel. And the first thing we need to do before we can start assigning any uh, orders to them is give them a front line. Now we can just highlight, just simply click a front line like this and it's going to basically cover the entire front line. And that basically means that we're assigning Arun Rommel to cover this whole front line. Now since we broke this down into three armies, which like I said may not exactly be the most efficient thing to do, uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to give him a smaller front. Now the way we do that is just right click on the front that we want to give him. And I think he started over here. Um, so we're going to just go ahead and drag it over, right click, just like that. And if you ever want to adjust it, you can just right click or you could just click on front line again and then right click and drag this some more to change that. It happened we do like the way this is set up. So now we have a front line set up for our purple unit. So now let's go to our orange unit, army three, and we're going to do the same thing. We're going to give them a front line and it's going to start over here where their front line ended. And then we're going to drag it out to right there. Actually, I do want to edit that. We're going to actually put it right there. And now let's get the, uh, I guess this is like the, I don't know what color it is. <laughs> Purplish pink color. And Oops, my bad. Don't want them to do that, but that's fine. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and assign them to this front line here. 
Now that all of our unit or armies have front lines, we can go ahead and start giving them orders. Now, the way to give them an order is right here, the offensive line. Now, with an offensive line, you're basically assigning where you want them to go to. Now, if you want them to just take a particular province, like let's say we wanted our orange unit over here, our orange army, to beeline to Warsaw, we could just click on that. And then they're, they're going to make their way to Warsaw, of course, covering their lines so that they don't get uh, cut off from supply. And they will do all that. However, we don't want to do that. We want to actually draw out the lines that we want them to go to in this particular instance. So I'm gonna go ahead and take our purple unit under the desert fox here, and we're gonna draw out their offensive line. Now we want them to take all of this right here. That is their goal. They're gonna march to there. Like I said, once again, this is not the most efficient thing. We're just looking at this. Now you see they have these arrows here that are showing you where they're going to go. Now one of the really cool things about this feature is that you can hover over the arrow and it's going to show you the, uh, the way that they're going to advance up to the objective that you have assigned them. And I find this to be a really cool part of this uh, mechanic. Next we're going to go ahead and assign our orange unit the same thing. We want them to take Warsaw though and we are going to give them a line that stretches down. Oops, it would help if I hit the offensive line. And we're going to have them go like so. Now let's give Heinz an order as well. And we're going to have him just advance out to here because reasons. All right, so now all of our units have offensive lines that they're going to advance to. An important part of battle plans here is that they get a preparation bonus. Now there's a little uh, bar here that shows you their current preparation. At the top tells you their the attack bonus they're getting. They're not going to get anything yet because they just started. Uh, and it's going to tell you that the preparation is increasing by 3.5% each day up to the base maximum of 50%. The attack bonus provided by preparation can be very, very significant, especially when you are facing uh, forces that are equal to your own. So it can often behoove you to uh, let that preparation bar fill up as much as possible. So let's go ahead and unpause the game just for a little bit just to watch this fill up. Now we let this go and you'll see that the bar is slowly filling up every day. We're getting 3.5% and you can see that we're getting a preparation attack bonus of 21% you know, now. Let's go ahead and pause the game and I feel like our units are ready to go. Uh, well, I kind of want to wait until it's daytime. There we go. Now, while I may feel that our units are ready to go, our generals may disagree with us. Now, there's a little arrow over here. Now, you'll see a little uh, check mark here. This means that they believe that their plan is, they agree with me and that their plan is ready to go. And there's little values down here and show you why they believe that. And you'll notice that he's green as well. But over here, this guy's yellow. You can see that he does not feel that the plan is good. He feels that it's risky, and largely because it's a large river crossing and that they haven't prepared enough. So you may want to listen to your general, or you may want to say, hey, you don't know what you're talking about. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We are going to go ahead and declare war on Poland and get World War II started. Actually, I think... Oh, yes, we do. All right, well, I want to invite these guys to our faction. This is something you can see on the diplomacy screen. We can invite other countries to our factions, and I did not mean to click that. And I wanted to do that real quick. And they will probably agree very quickly. There we go. And now we're going to go ahead and declare war on Poland. Poland and we're gonna call all our allies into this war and World War two is about to begin now you see their units are still not doing anything that's because we've given them their orders we've told them what they need to do but we have not told them to execute those orders yet and to do that we're gonna go ahead and click these arrows and we're gonna go ahead and tell all of them to execute their orders then that's basically it for land units guys uh, it's pretty much just uh, uh, assigning them uh, offensive um, lines or, or certain provinces that you want them to advance to now there are a few other things regarding the land units that we can use here in the battle plans and I'm gonna quickly cover those one of them is the fallback line. Now let's say you have been advancing and then you, you basically get stopped dead in your tracks and you realize that you do not have the uh, divisions or manpower or equipment or whatever needed to continue your advance and you decide that you need to set up a defensive perimeter. But where you're at currently is not the best place. You would like to set up in a more defensible position such as maybe on a mountain or maybe behind a river. Uh, that's exactly what we're going to do right now. We're going to go ahead and select our orange unit here and we're going to give them a fallback line right behind this river just like that just drag it along and there we go 
and when we tell them to they will fall back to that line now we're going to go ahead and delete that remember you can select this trash can button and select any orders that you want to quickly delete them because we have no intention of falling back and the only other thing is the garrison area, which I've already covered that earlier when we were talking about training. So we're just going to go ahead and leave that be. So now that we've covered land units, we're going to go ahead and talk about air and Navy units. Now, first up is Air Force, guys. Now, you can see your little airports on the map here. And when you click on them, you can see which, uh, which planes you have located there, what air wings. Now, to quickly break down this screen here, uh, basically it tells you we have 282 total planes here. We can have up to 2,000. Uh, you also see these priorities here. This is their priorities for uh, basically getting equipment. So if you were to select them on higher priority, then these uh, like these fighters here would get equipment before every, everybody else. Now, another important thing on this screen here is uh, planes do not gain experience the way that troops and ships do. Ships and, and, and troops both gain experience as they fight. Planes do not. Instead, as planes fight, they gain a chance to get ace pilots. And of course, there are ways to modify that. Now, ace pilot can be assigned to uh, air wing. And you'll see that we actually have one here. Now, every ace pilot has a certain type of plane that he is familiar with, and you have to assign them to those types of planes. In this case, uh, 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 I guess Hartman is familiar with fighters, so we can assign him to this uh, fighter air wing and he's gonna give them the following bonuses. So we're gonna go ahead and assign him there and now you can see his uh, pretty little face right there. So first up, how do we move uh, air wings? Now all you need to do is click the air wing that you'd like to move or multiple air wings if you wanted to move uh, several air wings at the same time. And we're gonna go ahead and just right click. So we want to move our, uh, our fighter unit over to here and then he will move there slowly and oh yes we have our war going on and world war ii has began guys and it will take a little bit of time for him to move over there and now that he is there and you see that he has arrived now hartman is over here in this airport very very simple now next in order to get our planes uh, assigned to missions we need to assign them to an area now we are currently in the strategic air map mode and these are big air regions where you assign missions. Now if you click on these you'll see in Western Poland we don't have any planes assigned to that area. We're going to go ahead and select all of these planes here and assign them. We can either click right here or we can just click right here and now they are all assigned to Western Poland. However we have not given the missions yet and we're about to do that but first I want to go ahead and break down this screen just a little bit. Now over here is you and over here is your enemies. Now you can see your radar efficiency which I already covered uh, radars in the last video. You can also see the total planes are act uh, that are active in this area as well as the total anti-air guns. Um, this uh, button here will show you weather and the, what the weather is as well as what the current air su superior is uh, this is a cool little detail button right here this just basically gives you statistics shows uh, all, all the damage that your planes have done as well as all the damage uh, that uh, have been done to your planes and vice versa for the enemy oh interesting little thing if you want to see how effective your uh, Air Force has been in this area all right, so let's move along. Now, these first buttons here, they control uh, when, uh, when your uh, your air wings will stop uh, conducting missions based on how much damage they've taken. So it's for some reason, and I don't understand this, the default setting is no retreat. So they will continue to conduct missions regardless of how much damage they have taken. Now, I personally prefer to change it to normal operations. Therefore, at 25% strength, uh, once they get below that, they're going to stop conducting operations. And then you can also do low intensity, which uh, is below 50 percent they will uh, no longer do uh, missions so we would I personally would change all these to normal operations now this next tab determines whether the, your uh, air wing uh, operates at night day or both so we can just select that and now it's at night and both day <clears throat> now the major difference here between day and night operations is for day operations it's easier for your planes to hit their targets it's easier to hit the, the land units you have them bombing or the infrastructure or the, the factories. However, at the same time, it makes it easier for your enemies to hit you. So basically, you're going to do more damage to the enemy, but the enemy is going to do more damage to your planes during the daytime. And at night, of course, it's vice versa. You're going to uh, do a lot less damage, but your planes will also take less damage as well. So it's basically, uh, it's up to you however uh, you, you want to run this. Um, we're going to go ahead and leave it on day and night operations. 
Now this next thing we're gonna look at is actually very important. It may not seem it, but it's, it's the mission efficiency of this uh, particular air wing. And this is primarily determined by your air wings range. Can they cover the entire area? You know, based on where you have them stationed, which airport they're activating on, or which airport they are uh, working out of, as well as that uh, air wings uh, current range. Now you'll see here, th these tactical bombers, their mission efficiency is 100%. However, these fighters are, are not able to completely cover this area, which therefore would mean that perhaps if that's a problem for you, you may want to move them to a closer airport, or perhaps you need to conquer a airport of the enemy for them to increase their mission efficiency. Now we're gonna briefly cover over the, the types of missions that you have available. I'm not gonna go over them too much because of course they all have two tips that basically explain exactly what I'm gonna say here. Uh, for fighters, they have two missions they could do. Air superiority, which basically means that, that they're gonna focus on fighters over bombers. They're gonna try and take out the fighters first so that you can gain control of the skies. And of course, interception is the exact opposite. They're gonna focus on taking out the bombers and not worry so much about the fighters. Now you have close support. Now their missions are a close air support where they're gonna support the ground troops in their battles. And then you have port strike where the air wing is gonna focus on taking out navies that are being cowards and hiding inside of ports. Now these same missions are also available for tactical bombers. Now one mission that is not available for tactical bombers, but you can conduct with close air support uh, air wings or with the naval bombers is the naval strike. And this is one that you would obviously not want to assign to a land area. You might want to assign to the Baltic Sea. And this is of course where they're gonna try and take out naval units. Now tactical bom bombers alternatively have the strategic bombing. Now this is also available to uh, strategic bombers and that's where they're gonna focus on and blowing up buildings, you know, factories, infrastructures, industry, and, and that, those sorts of things. All right, so there is one more thing that I wanted to cover on the air uh, war side of things. Now, this is a question that I have seen come up on the forums multiple times, and it's also something that I was actually really confused of when I first started playing, and I, uh, it took me a little while to figure it out. Um, now, when I covered research the other day, one thing that I completely forgot to mention is that there are these little tabs on the research. And each one of these little tabs will do different things. Now, for instance, we have the Panzer II here, and we can use this chassis, uh, the chassis of this Panzer II to create other different types of units. For instance, if we click on this and research this, we can use the Panzer II to create tank destroyers. We could also use it to uh, create self-propelled artillery, or we could also use it to create anti-air units. Now, with air units, you'll see that they also have a little tab here. Now, this the question that I always see coming up is, how do you put planes onto uh, Air Force carriers? And most of the time when people can't figure this out is because they don't have any planes that they, or any model planes that they have researched the uh, Air Force carrier equivalent. In order to put any one of these models onto an Air Force carrier, you have to research this. And this is something that I also was, uh, it took me a little while to figure out. Once you research that, you'll be able to put that model onto Air Force carriers. Now, you can only do that with these units here, these smaller planes. With the larger planes, the uh, heavy fighters, tactical bombers, and strategic bombers, they cannot go onto Air Force carriers. And that is it for Air Force, guys. That's pretty much everything you need to know to be able to conduct air missions in your campaigns. Now, let's move on to the navies. Now, Navy, similar to Air Force, is uh, pretty similar. This should be pretty quick. We'll, we're going to select one of these submarine units. We're going to give them a commander just because I want to. Uh, we're going to give him this guy because he's a Sea Wolf, so he's going to increase the submarine attack. And one thing that I would like to note about admirals is that unlike the uh, uh, generals, they there is not a higher equivalent for you to promote them to. Uh, and that's just one thing that we should mention real quick. Now, on this screen here, now you'll see that they, like the air airplanes, they have a priority for when they repair. You can have them repair when they only when they take severe damage, when they take average damage, or have them repair with even the mild damage. Of course, you're going to have them never repair, so that they're just always out there, regardless of how much damage they have taken. Of course, there's also a little button here that allows you to change whether they fire at will or where they uh, don't engage other naval units. And, but this right here is the bread and butter. These uh, little keys up here, which are kind of hard to notice, are actually where you assign the missions for your naval units. Now there's four missions that we can assign naval units, and I'm not gonna go into them in real detail because once again, these things are covered in the tooltip. You gotta love Paradox, they do have some great tooltips. Now with these first two missions, patrol and search and destroy, the purpose of these missions is to engage with the uh, enemy navy. 
Now the the difference between these is their formation spread. Now with patrol, your units are going to be very spread out, which means that it's going to be much easier for them to find the naval units. It's going to be harder for them to get through uh, that area uh, without you detecting them. However, the negative of this is that when you go into combat, less of your units are going to be initially in that combat. So if we had seven submarines, it may only be one or two units that uh, start out in combat, and then we're going to have to wait for the rest of the fleet to get there, which of course could compromise those few units that have first made uh, contact. Now, the next mission, Search and Destroy, is the exact opposite. We're going to have a much tighter formation, which means it's going to be much harder for us to find the enemy, and they may be able to slip past us. However, if we do engage them, then we'll have a, a much higher percentage of our Navy there uh, in order to, uh, that can fight them. Now the next two missions is regarding convoys. Now we can send them on convoy raiding, which is just what it sa says. Uh, you're going to attempt to sink the convoys of your enemies. And then of course you have convoy escort, where you're going to attempt to escort your own convoys uh, and protect them against raiding. Now with these submarines here, we're going to go ahead and assign them to convoy raiding because that's what you do. Now in order to do that, once we select that, then we're going to go ahead and select the areas that we want them to operate in. Now we're going to have them operate in the Baltic Sea, the Eastern North Sea, and the Eastern Channel. And just like that, they're going to start conducting these, this mission that we assigned to them. They're going to start sinking our enemy uh, convoys in these three areas. And that's basically it, guys. That's pretty, That essentially covers everything that I really wanted to cover here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and assign th these missions to... Um, our planes here. We're gonna give uh, this guy interception, and the heavy fighter is gonna be air superiority, superiority, if I can say it. And we're gonna give them all close support, and then we're just gonna let it let it conduct here. So you guys now essentially know everything that you need to know in order to start playing this game, start conquering your enemies, or stopping these. Uh, uh, Hey, there's a lot of pop-ups coming here. Stopping these access from attempting to their, uh, stopping their attempts at Royal Conquest. And we also had an ace pilot promoted. That's awesome. Uh, but yeah, that's basically it, guys. You're going to go ahead and see that these guys are doing their missions as we have told them. And Poland has joined the Allies, of course. Let's put this back on land. And I have all kinds of issues here. We have it on full fast forward. And you can see that they are operating, they're doing their missions, just that we said, and it's working quite well. Um, and I'm glad that I continued with this, because I just realized that I have forgot two key things that I wanted to cover in this video, guys. The first one is paratroopers, and I can't believe I forgot about these two things. So let's go ahead and assign these paratroopers to a group so that we can give them a battle plan. And the battle plan that we want to give them is the paratroop order. Now in order to give them paratroop order, we're just going to click on that. Now we have to select which uh, uh, airport or which uh, airport we want them to fly out of. Of course, they're right next to one, so we're going to uh, pick that one. And now we have to choose where we want them to land. And we're just going to go ahead and select right there. And that's all you have to do to set your paratroopers up. And now they are going to conduct that as soon as we hit that button. And they're going to go ahead and fly over to there. And they are already there, guys. Just like that. And they are ready to start engaging the enemy. And then the last thing that we're going to cover is naval invasions. Now we have a unit right here. Now the first thing we need to do is go ahead and select in the battle plans a naval invasion order. And just like the paratroopers, uh, we need to select an area that they're going to come out of. This is going to be a port though. And this is the port that we want him to invade from. And now we have to select where we want him to invade. Now in this case, we're going to go ahead and have him invade right there. And that is all you have to do, guys. It's that simple. You have set up a naval invasion. Now if we had more than one unit, we could have selected more, uh, s several provinces. And another thing thing that I did not cover is after you have a unit set to do something, you can then give him further orders. So if we wanted to, let's say, set up an offensive attack after he conducts that to that province there, and now when he lands, after he takes this province, he's going to go ahead and move on to this one. And that is it, guys. I, I can't believe I forgot about <laughs> those two things, but I am glad that I continued playing so that I could cover those. Um, but yeah, if you guys enjoyed this video, then please leave a like if it was helpful for you. Uh, yeah, leave a like, leave a comment uh, for any other uh, suggestions you may have for me to improve my videos. Um, 
And we'd also really appreciate it if you guys subscribe to the channel. And it looks like U Yugoslavia wants to send us six divisions as an expeditionary force. And uh, there's another thing that I can quickly show you. Basically, expeditionary forces, unlike the volunteers that I showed in the last video, will be under uh, your control, the one uh, who was assigned the expeditionary force, instead of the volunteers, where if they had sent us volunteers, they would have been in control of them. But yeah, that's it, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope that was helpful. And thanks for watching.